Okay, so my uh, talk's going to be on Docker security. So before I start, who here has used Docker? Put your hand up if you use Docker. Okay, that's a good indication, thanks. <laughs> I'm glad to see that. Even if you've not used Docker very much, you should get something out of this. There is some specific and sort of technical stuff later on, but there's also some general stuff that should be of interest to most of you. Um, so a little bit about me. I'm, I work for a company called Container Solutions. Uh, we're a Dutch consultancy around containers and also Mesos, things like that. Uh, and the main thing I'm doing at the minute is just finishing up a book called Using Docker for O'Reilly. Um, so this talk, uh, I thought I'd have a little bit of fun with it. So we're going to start out with a five-round security boxing match. Although I was thinking the way here it should have been a rugby match because I think the Rugby World Cup kicks off tonight. But it's a five-round security boxing match between containers and VMs. And uh, the second half of the talk, it's going to be more specific container security tips and techniques. OK, so containers versus VMs. So what are we fighting for when we're thinking about security? Um, it's not actually Sugar Ray Leonard's WBA world title belt. Um, what we're fighting for is nothing. Because if you get security right, nothing happens. What doesn't happen is your site doesn't go down because somebody's managed to DOS you. What doesn't happen is your front page doesn't look like this because some script kiddies got in and restyled it for you. What doesn't happen is you don't start selling farmer um, Viagra on the side, or at least I assume Tame Town Council didn't mean to sell Viagra on the side. Uh, what really doesn't happen is you don't lose all your customers' credit card details. Um, Adobe just about got away with it, but uh, Smaller companies you know, could be bankrupt from this. Uh, and what really, really doesn't happen is you don't lose uh, sensitive background information on military and intelligence personnel. This, I think this is one of the worst hacks that we know about because this directly put people's lives at risk. These are people that could be targeted by uh, foreign governments and criminal elements. So that was quite horrific in my eyes. Um, so who are the contenders in our fight? Well, you've got to say the VN, the VM is basically the reigning heavyweight champion, if you like. VMs are used in banks, they're used in governments. Um, everybody uses VMs. Been around for a while, we trust them. Compared to this, containers are the unknown upstart. However, I think they bring some new features, of, of, uh, like security features that does actually make for an interesting fight when you put them head to head. OK, so round one, isolation guarantees. So here I'm just thinking about um, how isolated are the processes inside a VM or a container. Can somebody break out of the VM or container and access other VMs or containers on the host or the host itself? And here. The big thing is the VMs have this sort of hypervisor layer. And the hypervisor, to some extent, acts as a buffer or a filter and can cut out a lot of attacks. And when you compare this to containers, containers share the kernel, right? So the, each container is within the same kernel as the host. So if a container manages to cause, say, for example, a kernel panic, uh, that would take down the kernel for the host and all the other running containers. Uh, similarly, if a container manages to grab all the memory, you'll starve out the other containers in the host. So I think you've got to give round one isolation to the VM. Um, so round two, attack surface. This is probably the most controversial of my, uh, the rounds in this fight. But I'm going to argue that there's a greater attack surface in a VM. And here I'm just comparing directly the VM to Linux kernel. So there's a lot more going on in the VM. It's a very large piece of code that does a lot of things like virtualization and emulation that just don't happen like by default in Linux. Uh, and so part of that is doing things like emulating devices and you know, virtualization. And there was the Venom vulnerability. It's one of the new vulnerabilities that gets its own web page, which seems to be a brand new thing. 
But um, the Venom vulnerability was quite interesting. Basically, there was a, a bug in some floppy disk drive emulation code that nobody really used, because who uses floppy disks anymore? OK. <laughs> that, that was an audience and participation point. <laughs> but anyway, they found a bug in that. And uh, that actually caused uh, a breakout. So uh, the VM could, an attacker could break out of the VM and access the host or other VMs. Um, there's also another side to this in that you can produce containers. And this is a separate issue. Before, I was looking at the actual attack service of the kernel compared to the VM. But another thing you can do with containers is build very minimal containers. So you can build a container that just contains like a single static binary. It doesn't have the whole operating system wrapped around it. So by doing that, you can cut out a lot of stuff that could potentially be used to attack you. Uh, yeah, so a minimal container may only contain a static binary. And you know, by doing that, you really are cutting down the attack surface. So for that reason, I'm going to give this round to the container. Uh, round three, controls. So here I'm really thinking about um, what knobs can you twiddle and what buttons can you push to restrict the privileges and resources assigned to a container or a VM. So if you think about limiting access to the actual hardware resources, the memory, the CPU, and the disk, they're both pretty good, right? You can do pretty much the same thing with, CPU, with VMs and with containers. But I'm going to argue that you get more controls with containers. So you can do things like set file systems to read only. I'm pretty sure you can do it with VMs as well. I'm not an expert in VMs, but I'm sure you can. However, with containers, it's quite simple. And you can also do things like poke holes in it so certain files can be read-write, whilst the rest of the file system is read-only. And we'll see that later. And <clears throat> there's also kernel, Linux kernel capabilities. So Linux kernel defines, I think there's about 40 different capabilities. And these are just sets of calls that you can make. So what you can do is you can reduce the capabilities of a given container and say, this container can't create network sockets or can't create set UID binaries, things like that. Um, there's also set comp coming. To, it's not available yet, but it is common to Docker containers. And that will allow even more fine-grained access to exactly which kernel calls a container can make. So I'm going to argue that the container also wins this round. Um, so round four, auditing. So here I'm thinking, if you run a, like, a large VM system or a large container system, every now and again, you need to like, look at the system and make sure the images you're running are up to date. They're not using old um, vulnerable versions of software, for example. Um, so the first thing that you might notice is that in a typical system, you're going to be running considerably more v containers than you would be running VMs. So a system that runs in dozens of VMs may actually run the equivalent system may use thousands of containers. So uh, one way of thinking maybe that there's more to audit. But that doesn't tell the whole story. Uh, the big thing is VMs are longer lived. And you compare that to containers, which are, if you're doing it right, are ephemeral. So VMs over time diverge from the base image. And we have a whole branch of software called configuration management that's sprung up around this in an attempt to uh, try and make VMs consistent over time. And so what this effectively means, if you're running VMs in production, you're never quite sure what state they're in. Like in two VMs that are ostensibly doing the same thing are quite likely to have different versions of libraries and so on. So you need, when you audit, you have to audit each one of them separately. If you compare that to containers, if you're doing it properly, what you do is you replace a container. You don't patch it. So you take down the container and put it up with a new one that's built from an image uh, that, has been, that has the update. And what this means is you can actually audit your images offline as opposed to your online containers. And then you can verify that your containers haven't diverged from the image. And there's tools like, and so the point of that is um, you can verify one image, and you may have actually audited hundreds of containers effectively. And you can use tools like Docker diff to, one, make sure that your containers haven't diverged from um, the image they were created from. And also, it's quite nice for telling if you've been hacked. Because uh, 
if you say it's like the, the script kitty attack where they change the front page, if that was running in a container and you ran Docker diff, you'd immediately see like the CSS files or HTML files that had been changed or added. Um, similarly, if you run the pharma spam thing, you'd probably find a file that was actually contained a bunch of PHP code. And you, you know, you'd find it very easily using the docker diff command. So I'm going to give that round also to the container. But the final round, round five, is track record. And here, I'm going to say VMs have quite a strong advantage, right? They've got a proven record. They've been around for years. Everybody trusts them. Banks trust them. Governments trust them. And you compare this to containers who simply don't have the same track record. That, OK, you can argue that containers have been around for a while, but certainly not in the modern sense of Docker containers and so on. And it's going to take time before people come to trust them with regard to security. So I'm going to give that round quite heavily to the VM. Now, I'm sure some of you are good at math and have added this up. But I was wondering, who thinks the VM should win this fight? Put your hand up if you think the VM should win. Put your hand up if you think the container should win. Oh, a OK, cool. I, to be honest, I wished out and called it a draw. Which I guess most of you could do math probably figured that, but. Pardon? That's my next slide. <laughs> but I will say, beware of the rematch, because there's a lot of interesting work being done. So one thing is, there's a lot of work going on to speed up VMs. So you, you're actually going to see VMs, I think, being used in a more container-style workflow. So it's, um, projects like Clear Container from Intel, that's actually using VMs in a sort of container style, st in a container style. And also, there's a lot of work going on to secure containers. So there's things like SitComp from Docker. But there's also a lot of work going on with the Linux kernel maintainers to make sure C groups and namespaces and so on are secure and do everything they should. So in a few years' time, it will be interesting to see where we are. But as um, Adrian said, at the minute, the way you're probably going to go is you're going to use both containers and VMs. And that way, you've got two layers of security. Um, so you'll, you, the best way to do it is to use VMs to segregate groups of containers. So for example, you run a multi-tenant application. You place each tenant or user or customer. They have their own VMs in which they run the containers. And that's what Amazon and Google do. Google's a bit of an interesting one, though, because they use Kubernetes. Your containers are running VMs, but those VMs are in turn running Borg, which is containers. So you've got containers and VMs and containers. Um, the other way you can segregate things is if you have, uh, say you've got a large web app, and you've got a front end running PHP or Node.js, you put those containers in one VM, and then in another VM, you do like uh, the containers running, say, credit card processing. So if an attacker gets, breaks into a Node.js container, you still got to break out of that VM and into another one to get anywhere near the credit card information. OK, so that's it for the first part of the talk. The next part is just going to be uh, general security tips regarding containers. Um, actually, if there's one thing you take away from this talk, I want it to be this slide. So security paradigms. The first one is defense in depth. Don't rely on just one layer of security. So Chris in his talk earlier was um, talking, he mentioned firewalls. And it used to be we relied quite heavily on our firewall to cut out a lot of attacks. But nowadays, it's much less useful because everything comes through HTTP. So there only is one port, or two ports if you include HTTPS. Um, so don't just rely on the firewall. Don't just rely on containers. Use VMs as well. Don't just rely on that. Keep everything encrypted. That's sensitive. And what you're always thinking is, if an attacker gets past this layer of security, what does he have access to? And you should always try to put an extra hurdle in the way of getting to your sensitive information. Uh, the other paradigm is least privilege. So this is just the idea that a container should only have access to data and resources that are essential to its function. This is like quite an old idea. It was used to be applied to even like functions and classes and so on. Uh, Jerry Saltzer, I think, first articulated it. Uh, and doing that, if, the, if an attacker breaks in, to the, it goes back to the idea of breaking into the front end, shouldn't be able to be able to get access to the credit card details, things like that. 
Uh, you can liken it to the secure, the military idea of need to know where people are only told the minimum they need to know to complete their mission, and that way if they're captured, they can't spell secrets. Um, there's also a very good talk in this that was given at DockerCon called Least Privileged Microservices by Nathan McCauley and Diogo Monica from Docker. So check that out if you want to know more about least privilege. OK, some more specific tips. The one that most commonly people get wrong, and if you look on like the Docker Hub and you look at the images, the biggest mistake people make is to do with users. And so the thing to be aware of is that users aren't namespaced in the Linux kernel. So if you root inside a container, that's actually the same user as root in the host. What that means is if you break out of a container that's running as a root process, that whose process is running as root, you'll be root on the host, which is clearly a very bad thing. Now, there is work going on at the minute in Docker to automatically map the root user in a container to like a high numbered user in the host, but uh, that's not there yet. And also, I suspect there'll be issues regarding uh, file permissions and so on. So, in the meantime, it's very important, and to be honest, anyway, it's very important to set a user. So, in your images, or sorry, in your Docker files, if you include like two lines like that, what that does is it creates a user and changes to that user for all the following lines in the Docker file and when the container starts up. If you look at the official images, they quite often include the first line but not the second line. And the reason is in their entry point script or the, in an entry point script that gets run when the container starts, they want to do something like set file permissions which requires root privileges. So what they do is they set those permissions and then they use a tool like sudo or gosu to change to the appropriate user. But if you do one thing, do that. Um, set container file system read only. This is quite a handy one because it cuts out a lot of attacks and it's very simple to do. So if you just pass the dash dash read only flag when you start a container, uh, the container file system is completely read only and you can't write any files. Now, OK, most applications aren't going to be able to work like that. But what you can do is uh, create a volume for the files that I need to write to. So say your, your application just needs to write to a temp file. Just create one volume for that. And then if an attacker breaks in, they won't be able to do things like uh, you know, write out a script to serve farmer spam, as we saw earlier, or edit the file to change your front page. Uh, very similarly, you can set volumes to be read-only. Went well on that. Um, Drop capabilities. So going back to the point about Linux capabilities, what you do is you pass a dash dash cap dash drop argument to drop a capability. So in this first line here, we're dropping the ability to set the UID and GID flags on files. Uh, you can also drop all capabilities and just add back the ones you need. The issue with this, of course, is that how do you know which capabilities you need? And it's a bit of a black eye. You end up just like testing it. So it is very useful, but it is a bit of extra work. CPU shares. Um, I always wonder whether or not to talk about this, because CPU is actually um, limited by default. So by default, if your CPU is pinned, if you're using all the CPU and a host, your containers actually see, share the CPU equally. They're each given it an equal share of the CPU. But you can change that. Um, you need to be aware that there's a default weighting of 1024. So in this example, we start a container, the default weighting of 1024, then we spin up two other containers with a weighting of 512 each. And what that will mean is the first container can take up to half the CPU, and the other two get a quarter each. But this only comes into effect when the CPU is pinned. Before that point, anybody can use as much as they like. And there's also other things like the completely fair scheduler that you can now use. So there is other ways to do CPU. But because it is limited by default, or shared by default, um, I wouldn't worry too much about that one. What I worry more about is memory limits, because a, uh, a container can go and grab as much memory as it likes. Uh, so you can pass a dash M flag to set, put a constraint on the amount of memory. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, do be aware, though, if you do that, that that sets the main memory, but there's also, you get the same amount of swap. So this gives you 512 megabytes of memory, plus 512 megabytes of swap. And there's a separate flag to limit the, the both of them. Uh, 
Uh, this is an interesting one. So you can also defang set UID and GID binaries. So if you look at the typical base images like Debian and Ubuntu. OK. Um, yeah, so you can. So the, the normal base images include quite a lot of uh, binaries that have set UID and set GID bits. And what this does is it allows them to have elevated privileges. So the classic example is ping. You don't really think of ping as being security sensitive, but it actually has elevated privileges so it can create raw network sockets. Um, what that means if, is if an attacker finds a, a bug in ping and uh, they can exploit it, they can elevate their own privileges within the system. And the funny thing is, you can find these um, binaries quite easily by just simply running find. I guess most of you are probably familiar with find. Uh, and you get this is like the ones in the default Debian image. And for example, who, hands up if you know what CHFN is. Does nobody know what CHFN does? See, so why is that in there? It actually stands for change finger name. Who remembers finger? OK, that's a bit better. So yeah, the full name? I think it's finger name. It's the, pass, the PID of your password with your long name in it, right? In the password file. Somewhere. Maybe. Well, anyway, nobody knows what it is, so why is it there? Um, so, and potentially, I mean, to be honest, it's probably not much of an issue because these are old and very well-tested utilities. So I'd be surprised if you find a vulnerability in them, but you could, and then an attacker would be able to elevate their privileges within the container. So it's actually trivial to defang them because you can just put this into your Docker file. And if you put that in, all that's going to happen is I'll go through all the files, find the ones that they are, and change the permissions on them and to remove the set UID bit. And just to prove it, if you run it again, you get that. Uh, another interesting one is you can turn off intercontainer communication. So when you launch your Docker daemon, and I just updated it to 1.8, so prior it was Docker dash D, but now it's Docker daemon. Um, if you pass a dash dash ICC equal a false flag, you turn off intercontainer communication. So your containers can't talk to each other. And your containers can't talk to each other, they can't attack each other. So when an attacker breaks in, he won't be able to go and attack other containers. So arguably peace. But it is a bit useless because now your application container can't talk to the database. So what you can do is you can set the IP tables flag which I think is now set by default. I'm not sure it used to be. Um, and if you set that, it allows linked containers to communicate. So it all sets IP tables rules that allows the exposed ports on two linked containers to communicate. But nothing else can communicate by default. Uh, normally, if you don't set ICC equal to false or anything else, all containers can actually ping each other and access each other's ports as they're free completely, which I think surprises some people. But, you, of course, you need to know the IP address of the other containers. Um, the final point, and this is, uh, goes back to talk this morning, if you saw Seth's talk, is sharing secrets. So you want to be able to get, put things like database passwords and uh, API tokens into your containers. And this is a, quite a tricky problem. Uh, we did have the same problem with VMs, but it was less exacerbated because VMs were longer lived, and you could do things manually if you had to. But nowadays, the containers are coming and going the whole time. It really is a pressure on to automate this process. So the first way you can get a secret into, the, into your container is to bake it into the image, right? Just write in your Docker file and put the API token in your Docker file. Hopefully, most of you agree that that's a bad idea, and you should not do that under any, on a, any situation. Uh, the next way is environment variables. And a lot of you probably do do this. Um, I'm not saying it's bad, but in containers, I don't think it's great either. The reason a lot of people use it is because it's the way suggested by 12-factor apps. And I'm not knocking 12-factor apps, but again, that was back in the VM world, and we're now in container land. Um, and the issue is just that environment variables, when you, you know, so the, the idea is you just put your dash e API token equal to your secret. And the problem is it can just be seen in too many places. So link containers get access to all the other containers that link to environment variables. So if you link two containers together, 
that container can see all the secrets in the other container, uh, which surprises some people. And also inspect. If you run inspect, you can see all the environment variables in the container. Um, they can't be deleted, so you might think, well, it's okay, I'll just go in and overwrite it. That won't work. You'll still be able to see it and inspect. But even worse, they tend to get included in reports, right? So you ask for a support request, and like, uh, the, your vendor says, okay, can I get details of your environment? So you just give it to them, and you, know, you just included all your secrets there, which clearly isn't a good thing. So I'm going to say environment variables, okay, they work but they're a bit too visible, and I wouldn't use them if I was you. So the next way, and I think this is probably the way most people are doing it at the minute, is just to mount files. So you keep your secrets in a file, and you mount that into the image, into the container, sorry. Uh, one of the nice things about that is that you can just mount a configuration file. So you, like with the, the problem with the environment variable is you also have to do some work to get that environment variable into the application quite commonly. Or at least with a, a file, you can just mount it into a configuration file, and it'll pick it up without any special tricks. Yeah, so this works, but it's a bit icky. And my main problem with it is that files tend to get checked into source control. And clearly, that's a bad thing when you've got secrets. So the future, I think, is going to be with these uh, secured key value stores. So a few of you might have been in Sys talk this morning when he talked about Vault. And I, yeah, I think that really is going to be one of the major ways to do things like this going forward. Basically, the idea is your key value store that has all your secrets in it. It's um, designed to store secrets, so it keeps them encrypted. Uh, it has special features like leases and so on. Um, yeah, so you can say how long a secret's good for. It might have break glass procedures, so you can lock everything down if somebody breaks in, things like that. Um, there's two main ones, Vault that Seth talked about this morning, and also Keywiz. Keywiz is quite interesting because it was built by the guys at Square who did uh, payment processing and so on. And the main engineers from there now actually work at Docker. So you, uh, Keywiz is probably likely to be very well supported. Um, a few of you are probably thinking, how does this actually solve the problem? because you have to authenticate to the key value store. So how are you going to do that from inside your container? Um, two ways. One is to go back to environment variables. So you pass an environment variable for, to validate the key value store, authenticate to the key value store, but you make it a one-off key. So it can be used once, and then it's useless. So at least an attacker gets it, it can't, it's no good to them. The other way, and it's a bit more complicated, but we now have volume plugins. Uh, and so you can actually, there's a volume plugin for both Keyways and Vault. And what that does is um, it creates a file inside the container that contains the secrets that that container has access to based on what um, they have the rights to access in Keyways or Vault. So now you've moved all the sort of secrets set up outside of the container itself. There's no tokens being passed in there. It's just this file that's um, populated from Key Wizard Vault. So I think that's probably the future. OK, I think that's pretty much all I want to talk about. Um, the main thing I wanted to drive home is that containers add security. So if you're using VM at the minute and you add containers into the mix, you only add in another layer of security. You're very unlikely to make things less secure. It's almost impossible. Maybe if you did things like uh, you know, add uh, when your thing is the root user. Um, yeah, use containers with VMs if you're concerned about security, and always think defense in depth and least privilege. Um, yeah, that's about it. Yep. And I've been playing with that a fair bit recently. One of the problems I've found is when you do that and then you use the copy or add it, yeah. the copy a file in, it ends up being owned by root inside the container, yep. irrespective of the user outside the container. And so what you end up doing is having to 
you no. essentially use a nasty pattern where you temporarily flip the roof, copy the file in, change the ownership of it, and then flip back to the original. Well, user. it won't be root you. Have you seen anything like that? Well, it won't be root user privilege. It'll just be the the privileges of. I'll just retain the privileges whatever file it was on the host. But uh, so, sorry, the privileges are the same, but the ownership isn't. Yeah. Okay. That's right. Yeah. So, and that's exactly why the official images don't have that user statement, right? Right, right? So, and if you look at the official images, they do, what they do is like for Postgres or Redis, what they do is uh, when the container starts up, they do like a pseudo CHO. Well, they don't do a pseudo, it's just a CHO, they're already root, so it's just CHO. And then they do a pseudo to the actual user. It's not actually pseudo they use, they use the tool called Gosu. Right. And Gosu is quite nice, because um, if you use sudo, you end up with two processes. But go through, like, uh, just forks that process, okay. or overrides that process. Cool. Yeah. I've got a question. It's uh, something Chris Wands talked about a bit, which is um, putting less in your containers. We didn't really talk about that. I mean, there's, you could put the whole of Linux in it, or you could just have Scratch and a, a Go, Go binary, or whatever, C binary. Yeah, absolutely. So, that, I mean, that comes back to the attack surface point. So you can really cut down on like the attack servers within the container by just putting the bare minimum in it. And also that goes on to then you think about unikernels and things like that. You think seeing uh, people doing that commonly or is it the people still sort of? Well, it's hard to tell what people do really at the minute. I'm not sure I've seen people, I don't think many people do it, no. It's, it's fairly advanced, I think, still. There's also an issue with um, debugging, right? So if you put the minimum in it, and something goes wrong and you want to debug that container, there's no tools. Like if you just got like a Go binary, you can't even get a shell. Yeah, so the question was, I guess is there's multiple, like the question is, um, you have things like CH root and other isolation mechanisms and how do they compare? And yeah, that's a fair point. I mean, as well as Docker, we already have Rocket uh, and there's free BS jails and Solaris zones and so on. And, um, I've never sat and compared them all, but Docker's going to be, it's pretty feature full and a bit more tested than a lot of them. So I would say that's probably up there in terms of, maybe not security, but certainly features and isolation. Uh, CH root, um, there's always been issues issue with CH root. That's more of a, a play thing, I think. Is that fair? Anyone else? Okay. Well, thanks everyone for coming and have, have a safe trip home. And uh, hopefully we'll be back again next year. I think that <laughs> the, the big discussions were probably in uh, October, November rather than September and probably a single track conference again, but we're not quite sure what to make it about. So if you have any ideas, really looking for input and uh, any feedback or input on, on, on this conference as well. So thanks everybody. <laughs>